Hello and welcome to everyone to the AIM Summit webinar on reshaping the cybersecurity landscape. I'm your moderator, Zachary Zafrati, CEO and founder of Dalma Capital. We have over 20 countries participating in the session, institutional investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, and many leaders in the financial services industry. Please feel free to submit your questions as they come throughout the session on the Zoom Q&A dialogue you find at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Also go to aimsummit.com to tune into the live sessions and be part of the Q&A. Introducing our webinar partner today, Hera Software Development. The HeraSoft TM Ransomware Proof Solution, or RPSTM, helps organizations be more secure, function faster, and far less expensively than any traditional centralized enterprise cloud solution available today. Harrisoft's distributed solution eliminates single points of failure that make cloud-based software systems vulnerable to cyber attacks. By deploying Harrisoft, enterprises and government organizations can enhance both data security and application cybersecurity across industries such as import-export, banking, health, et cetera. I'm so glad to be introducing our speakers today. We have Anthem uh, Hayek Blanchard. He's the CEO and co-founder of Hero Software Development. We also have Shira Rubinoff, the Chief Strategy Officer, and George Sebastio, the CEO of Nimbus DeFi and founder and director of Global Blockchain Organization. Anthem, it's such a pleasure to have you today. Would love to, to hear you know, what your views are on the current status quo and the challenges that many organizations face in cybersecurity. Thank you, Zachary, and thank you everyone for attending, Raha and the whole AIM Summit team, Flo, thank you. And of course, Shira and George. Um, really what's plaguing our world today is um, more and more and more attacks on enterprises and governments. And what attackers are doing is they're preying on vulnerabilities that have existed for a long time. And what's happening is the data that has been so stolen from us over the years is so stolen now that these bad actor criminals are now looking to go past theft of data and are looking to compromise entire systems, the data and the systems themselves. And never before in history have we been so vulnerable as a society because all of our trade and commerce is digital. So we need systems and software that we can trust to deliver our goods and services out of a year where the world has been shut down by global pandemic, one of the only things that saved us was our digital infrastructure. That's what kept us online. That's what kept businesses growing and uh, wheels turning. Businesses that weren't able to go online have faced the biggest challenges in, in this environment. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari actually recently published an op-ed in the FT where he uh, looked back at how the world should be proud of itself and, and how we reacted to this coronavirus and how quickly markets and governments and uh, the, the healthcare industry were able to respond, but um, that it actually has exposed potential risks and vulnerabilities in our digital infrastructure in which we've become so reliant. So maybe we could take a deeper dive into the, uh, you know, the, the economic impacts of cyber, cyber attacks on businesses and the, the challenges that, that are uh, lying ahead of us. Uh, he, in his op-ed, he identified this as the biggest risk that the world is facing at the moment. Um, so uh, please walk us through the numbers. Yeah, and I just shared uh, some information here for you uh, and for the viewers. You can see this is a, these are numbers put together by Gardner Group. About five, six years ago, ransomware was under half a billion dollars of a recognized threat. And today that number is over 20 billion. So over the course of about five years, the number has gone up you know, well over exponentially. We're, we're talking about you know, a, a, a massive you know, 50X, you know, 20, you know, it, it, it's 100X type gains now we're seeing in terms of the increase in the scale. And effectively what we have is we have very, very expensive hardware being deployed in centralized manners ultimately. And basically what happens is that it's very, very expensive to continue to deploy all of this hardware and basically have to multiply the amount of times that you have to intake traffic to do filtering, to try to take out bad things like viruses and, and bad applications that could compromise systems. And effectively what our team at Hera has done is basically harness the power of a type of software called public protocol that Bitcoin invented about 12 years ago. And we layer these types of distributed 
uh, architectures. You can see it's more of a spider web here in terms of the distributed approach, as opposed to like a hub and spoke model that is very, very capital expenditure intensive because it requires a great deal amount of hardware that has to be purchased by the enterprise company itself. So um, it, it's much cheaper, more efficient, and binary safer to have a distributed network. So that's, that's where the world is going, and we're excited to be helping to usher this new world in. You've highlighted how the centralized architecture creates single points of failure and attack. Um, and I, I, but uh, solutions that are, uh, I mean, what, what exactly does it mean when, when you, you talk about, uh, you know, a, a distributed solution? Can you, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about what this is like in practice and how this is, interacts with and has been part of cloud, uh, cloud computing? Absolutely. So effectively what distributed means is that there's multiple points of presence and there's zero single point that only touches one other single point. So there's always redundancy. There's never one point that can be compromised and basically choke an entire system. That is how all of our best standard, best practice clouds work today is that they have these choke points. They have single points of failure from the organizations that serve the cloud. And these central points of failure are compromisable and they're very expensive to protect. They require a great deal of hardware that effectively can be compromised simply by software attacks. So uh, basically what happens is a disproportionate advantage to the attacker, the bad actor, trying to get to our data or compromise the applications that our data is getting served from and then holding companies and organizations that we rely upon to serve our information ransom. And that ultimately rises the cost for all of us a great deal um, because when systems have more costs, those costs get passed down to the users. So um, that's why more efficient systems will enable more efficient commerce. And ultimately what we wanna do is help make commerce trustworthy by having trustworthy record keeping. And by having trustworthy record keeping, we can encourage good actions in the value creators instead of bad actors that unfortunately too often um, get, get the advantage uh, over good actors today. One of the things that we we've, were discussing before the session is the, the need for, for clients and uh, for all market participants to take a proactive approach to, uh, uh, to, to protecting themselves from ransomware attacks. Um, currently, uh, many, many clients, particularly SMEs, take a very reactive approach to this. Um, maybe, Ashura, if this is something that you could uh, help us dive deeper into, I understand that you're working with a lot of organizations on their, their strategy for, uh, for implementing and deploying different solutions for protecting themselves. Um, what are some of the key concerns that you think these businesses should be, should be thinking about and why is taking a proactive approach uh, necessary in this environment? Sure. So I would start off by talking more history of how organizations approached and businesses approached. As you mentioned exactly, it was more of a reactive, be ready if it comes, when it comes, what do we do? However, we all see and we all saw that that's not the way to behave. Um, we know that many organizations, if not all, have some infiltration of some sort of bad actors sitting there waiting. Maybe it's a low and slow, slowly start to uh, put out feelers, see how the attacks could slowly occur, and then just go, you know, haywire. And as we saw that um, uh, big breach attacks um, and ransomware attacks have gone rampant, and I'll just to go back a little bit about to your question that you talked about with COVID, how the world has changed and why the cyber attacks are that much more prominent. And as we see and moving forward to future work, they are becoming more rampant and organizations and the writings all around it and the cyber experts and the business leaders are all taking cybersecurity to be of that most much more importance and top of mind. It's not, let's convince the market, let's show the market. It's there's the pain point there. They're understanding the loss. They understand what it means to be breached. These ransomware attacks are at top of mind and need to be curtailed before they happen. So that proactive approach is critical. So we talk about proactive and reactive approach go hand in hand. One is not more important than the other. 
both have to be looked at systematically on the same level of importance. And, um, you know, in the past, we'd say, what do you do for a ransomware attack? A lot of the talk around it was backup often, backup off-prem in case your, your data was stolen. And that was pretty much standard. However, more, more uh, tighter security and proactive approach is needed, and the markets have proven that. And uh, when we come to Herasoft and the ransomware proof uh, software, it's really going to be the standard of what is needed when it comes to ransomware proof uh, it, software for organizations. Um, we talk about what to do, how to, how to set things up. But again, before it happens, this critical understanding what to do if it happens, have a plan in place. What happens if you are ransomware attacked? Who's responsible? Who has the onus on them? What steps are needed? So all those things are planned. All those things are looked at importantly, but also what is the right software? What is the right steps? What is the right focus to take in order to prevent it? Not just your systematic reactive approach. So that is where the market is today. And that is where things are headed. And that is why I was happy to join Harris off as their chief strategy officer. So maybe can you give us some examples of ransomware attacks that you've seen uh, with, with client organizations that didn't take a proactive approach that kind of damage that they suffered were, were uh, we've certainly seen this happen to some of our clients. We're, you know, uh, have attempted attacks on our systems all the time. Uh, fortunately, we've never uh, been exposed, but uh, certainly see the, the constant, constant attempts to attack our systems uh, through various and increasingly sophisticated approaches. Um, can, can you maybe give, give some examples of, of, you know, some of the cases that you've seen with, with clients and whether or not after uh, they were actually able to, to retrieve all of their systems, because we've heard of many cases where, you know, people send the, the Bitcoin or whatever they're, they're being held to ransom for um, and end up never actually recovering the, the data that were, uh, that were compromised. Of course, but I will actually point to one thing that you said, sophisticated attacks. Not all of them are sophisticated attacks. They could be as simple as a phishing uh, type situation. And because of the way that work from home has been, because of the way that COVID has shook in the world and the change of the way that organizations are handling their workflow and their um, organizations of working from home, working remote, a hybrid, whatever that may look for them, the other points of entree and the way that people are behaving are leading to people falling prey to attacks that would gain entry for them to actually infiltrate the organization. So we talk a lot about um, cyber hygiene within an organization. What does that mean? So that I've broken down to four points, which is ongoing training, global awareness within the organization, updated security and patching and zero trust, just to name a few. So when somebody is sitting there and maybe they have a child that might be zooming in and they have their separate work office um, off to the side locked down, but they actually have to sit there and make sure their child's on. So they'll take their handheld and sit there and maybe do work or log in from a different area just for that moment. And think about multitasking, think about how you, you have to move quickly. And a lot of the things are move quick, move fast, multitask, and the stop and pause might not be there, but also the openings for maybe I wanna hear more about what's going on with COVID. Maybe I wanna hear more about the, uh, the latest and greatest news from wherever I am. And bad actors may be trying to infiltrate you that way through a very light phishing attack that somebody might seem as completely friendly. So lots of points of entry there, lots of points of situations where it just becomes human nature to want to know more, but also became very personal too. People, when it comes personal to them, when information is something that's relevant to them and not just ambiguous, they are much more having their guard down in order to gain that information quickly. So think about those points of entry too. Um, in terms of organizations, you know, there's a lot of ways that organizations have handled it. A lot of them given to the ransomware have to pay in order to get their systems back up to speed. There are so many of them in the news today where you hear about ransomware attacks, how organizations have handled or organization X paid XYZ money to get their data back. But think about it that way from another perspective. If the bad actors understand that if they ransomware attack your organization, and the end of the day, of course, you need your data back and you need it back quickly, and you end up paying that ransomware attack, think about those little lists that they share across them. Don't you think an organization 
would be on that list for another bad actor to start infiltrating the other one because they're a played client. So there are many ways to think about it from an organization's perspective that they don't want to be that client that is sitting there on some list to be infiltrated from many different many different points. Uh, so when we talk about ransomware, we have to understand that the proactive piece is so critical because a lot of organizations have to be reactive and have to get that data and we'll think about it later, how to fix the situation. But right now we need to get our company back up. Right now we need to keep things moving as is. Right now it has to be business as usual or else organizations take a terrible hit. George, I'd love to hear your perspective. And also again, in the, in the media, we do hear uh, you know, from various sources where these cyber attacks are actually coming from. Uh, geographically, again, coming out of uh, certain, you know, certain countries, out of China, out of the, um, out of Iran, out of Russia, is that actually true? Is it? Does it really matter uh, with a global infrastructure? Is this uh, something that uh, that you see as a, a problem that kind of transcends national borders? Yes, uh, actually, as I mentioned and was highlighted by the previous speaker, one of the things that's very important is that the attack space has increased dramatically. That means we have produced more data in the last one to two years than we have ever produced before. So the more data we produce, the bigger the attack space, especially a lot of that data is being produced, for example, either by IoT kind of devices or by social media. The data is also of structured and unstructured uh, nature, like this includes video, status updates, and so on. If we look at just a recent attack that happened uh, against Facebook, where things like, for example, an entire database of more than a half a million user IDs, um, mobile emails get leaked. So we can expect a major uh, attack against these people. Uh, and the thing that, the facts that will take place are the nature of what we call sometimes in our business spear phishing attacks. It's not just a generic attack in which we um, send an email to an individual. This is an attack that already has knowledge about this individual, has knowledge about the role that he may play in an organization or relationship he may have. So this is induces that whether that attack comes from malware, ransomware, or otherwise, the chances of success are bigger. So that really means that tools that we're using today because they are centralized and they do not handle this data properly are not good enough to protect this data. That's where um, blockchain plays an important element of trust and the decentralized element of blockchain also allows us to timestamp the data and protect it with keys to ensure that uh, we're able to respond to it in a much more timely manner which means that even the attackers don't have the capability to attack the protection and mechanism. So all this innovation is dramatically changing the rules of how we do cybersecurity today. So uh, Shira had mentioned that often the, the biggest uh, point of weakness are individuals within organizations. You can have the best IT infrastructure, but if those individuals are falling prey to, to uh, targeted attacks um, and are not sufficiently trained, uh, in how to identify and prevent them, um, they can expose even the most sophisticated uh, organization's infrastructure. Uh, Shira, what are some of the key things that managers and teams should focus on when thinking about how to, to make sure that the team members within the organizations are fully up to, up to speed to, to protect the organization from attack? And, and would you agree that it's usually uh, uh, human beings that are the, the uh, biggest points of, uh, of, of risk or, or would you see, see that as coming from IoT devices or from uh, some of their physical infrastructure? Can I, can I just, uh, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify one piece that's, that's just important. The human, you know, we talk about as the weakest link in the chain, but it's not really just the human. When it comes to cybersecurity, it's the people, the process and the technology. I just wanted to clarify that, that you have three points. It's the humans, the people, it's either you're building something to secure somebody, you're building someone to attack somebody, so the person's at the end, and the people that are utilizing the technology it and working within the organization. The technology, which is the security elements, the hardware, the software, whatever you're doing over there with your organization to solve 
uh, break, attack, whatever that is. And then there's the process, which is the blue in the middle. So all three elements have to go in, in unison. And the process is how the organizations behave within their security as well as, their, or, as well as the humans. How do they, do they train them? Do they give them the right tools? How is it all implemented in? So it's not just the human, it's the, across the board, the people, the process and the technology. So just wanted to clarify that point. So I'm sorry, George, please go ahead. I, although the humans are the weakest point in cybersecurity, um, automation is key to help protect the humans. Um, if we go back uh, almost even 10 years ago when a cyber attack was done against RSA, RSA is a cybersecurity company. Obviously, the employees of RSA had the right knowledge to defend themselves. But even in the case of a very sophisticated phishing attack, the cybersecurity specialists did not were not able to detect that this was a phishing attempt. That really means that just cybersecurity awareness, training, et cetera, is not going to be enough to prevent future attacks. So we have to use a combination of awareness training, but as well a combination of automated tools, more sophisticated, more real time, more decentralized that use the power of blockchain to actually create um, equilibrium between uh, the attackers, which today uh, share information at extremely rapid pace. So what I'm really is quite important the issue, for example, that happened with Facebook, it's not the leak of Facebook is the issue, is what we're going to do with that data. Just um, not long ago, for example, the office of, um, that has all the database of the employees of the United States, the entire database got leaked with fingerprints and everything. So what really happened is as a result of this, what is the kind of sophisticated attack that can be launched as a result of such a leak? So organizations today, um, should worry not about what they know, they should worry about what they don't know. And the way you worry about what you don't know is by using a new combination of tools that are both decentralized and have the power to protect your infrastructure in a much better way. Uh, so going to the Q&A from the audience, we have a question uh, regarding the recent solar winds hack. Uh, and whether this would, what the impact is going to be on this uh, on this hack, potentially diverting their customer base to other service providers. Is this something uh, Anthem or, or Shira may be able to, to uh, shed some light on? Yeah, I'll talk about it as a global whole. You know, when these hacks happen and these organizations are, you know, sometimes they are sitting on the information about the hack just for a while. You know, when we talk about the Facebook, that attack happened a year ago. They sat on this um, this information for a year. I had actually talks yesterday with an organization that actually I uh, was working with Facebook to figure out how to deal with this and it's just coming to fruition now. Um, there have been other attacks that they sat on for two years. Uh, what, the, what does the organization do? They have to think about not only is their recovery mode or their reactive mode, but also how do they also protect their business? They have to have a certain element to recreate the level of trust and when people utilize um, any type of data or they work with any organization, the first element is, is there trust there? How can I trust the organization? I am putting whatever type of secure data in their hands, I'm giving them access. Can I trust them to be secure? What is that element around? What have they done? What are they doing? What is their new approach to this? And when it comes out, all the PR campaigns are gonna be perfect and they're gonna come out and say, well, here's what happened, we're being completely open with you. We wanna let you know you're our customer base. This is what we're doing in order to give you better uh, security and, and, and worrisome around your data. We'll give you um, some extra tools so you can look at um, maybe your credit report, all sorts of things that they'll do to try to make you feel that element of trust again. But people right now from in the past are taking a step back and trust is that much more important. Um, the element of really understanding what the organization is, what did they do beforehand? How did this really happen? And when you hear about these attacks that have come in through a phishing attack in such a big company, people would stop and pause and they'd say, this organization is somebody I'm trusting and somebody within the organization fell prey to a phishing attack or somebody was infiltrated and they didn't have the proper tools in place in order to protect their organization in such a massive amount of things happened in a negative way from this organization, do I want to stay there? What are the other options? So of course, other competitive organizations are going to come and dance all over that. 
and their campaigns are going to be, well, we don't do this. This is what we do um, instead. So their proactive approach is that much greater than the reactive approach from another organization. So when we talk about proactive and reactive, think about all those elements. You're going to have the best reactions from organizations, of course, because you're cleaning up the mess. But what's the proactive approach? How do we stop it before it happens? How do we put in proper security and technology in order to create this element of security that can't be infiltrated? What is the organization doing to look forward, not just giving niceties around it and slapping their own hand and then telling you how we're going to protect you after the fact, but what are we doing now? What's different? How is this, how, how are we setting this up so it just never occurs again? Are we using a decentralized system? Are we going to be utilizing different technology that should have been in place? Think about all those elements and you'll see the different types of ebbs and flows as organizations are taking different stands once things have happened within their, their global whole. And this is not the first time this has happened. This has actually repeated itself at least four or five times. And what is important to note here, these are the organizations like SolarWind and in the other cases, for example, was antivirus companies. I will not name the names, but I think we know who they are. That actually provided a backdoor, an effective backdoor to people to get into your own systems. Which means that these organizations, although they're in the trust and the cybersecurity business, they did not upgrade their technology to the right decentralization level that is today provided by blockchain. So that means the tools that were designed to defend you were simply not effective. Usually the term that I use today in cybersecurity is don't bring a knife to a gunfight. So if today you're thinking about seriously about cybersecurity, it is a gunfight. So don't only have to bring guns, you have to bring all your friends would have guns and they have to do it in a cooperative way to actually create a level playing field in cybersecurity. Otherwise, you're gonna get hacked and it's going to be very painful. The cost of each hack is in the 80 million plus neighborhood to recover for a serious business. So that really means the impact to the business is serious. If we, even in the case, for example, of blockchain, which is a trust technology, in 2018, over $2 billion of funds were siphoned from the wallets that were not effectively protected. So this is actually a very serious uh, area that needs to be addressed so that we have proper cybersecurity infrastructure that uses blockchain in an effective way. So you're, we've, we've talked about how organizations should really focus on investing and having the right cybersecurity infrastructure in place. Um, but actually, we have, again, looking at the audience, we have a lot of investors in this session who are, uh, some of whom I actually am aware of having made investments into cybersecurity companies themselves. Um, Anthem, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the landscape for investment into cybersecurity. Uh, is this a, a, a you know, an, a, a, obviously demand is, is growing, uh, the number of cyber attacks is growing, the industry uh, should be growing. Um, how would you look at it or how do you think investors should look at it from an investment perspective when they're looking at potentially investing in opportunities in this phenomenon? And that's a great question. And as a fellow investor, and family office uh, member myself, um, I look at you know some of the big names that are publicly traded and they've been outperforming the market the last few years relative to other technology stocks. And we really look here at Hera uh, as all of the existing uh, you know best practices leaders in the cybersecurity space as partners or potential partners. And, and we're really just providing a layer underneath that provides 100% uptime, ransomware proof, and perfect data integrity to Bitcoin level. And ultimately we wanna help evolve everyone's solutions to have a distributed approach. And basically what this means is that all of our identity, our username, our password, they all rest on our devices that we control, not on some distant centralized database, which is how we've always had to uh, do software in the past before these public protocols, these public blockchains. And what happens is that by removing all of the information in one central lo location, the attack of that one central location is removed. And so thereby, if one person's information is compromised, it 
eliminates the compromise of everyone else's information because all the information that's personal is private it, it stays on the user side and, and this is a very very important aspect to understand in terms of the differences between today's enterprise centralized cloud databases and tomorrow slash today's distributed um, to the edge of the user's data and ultimately distributed databases and eliminating central database that is a very, very easy honeypot for anyone to go in, uh, exploit, steal, um, take down, locker attack, make uh, inaccessible. So, um, you know, th that's really the solution is to distribute the data. And that's really what Hera and we built our platform Hercules does, which is a public protocol always anchors into Bitcoin and is effectively like a stack of, of layers together as one. So um, very similar to how we use layers of software today in a centralized stack, we did something comparable in a distributed stack. So I had one extra point to, to Anthem. It is actually quite critical since you're talking about investment. Last year, the investment attention to cybersecurity was major. Out of the people that, uh, or organizations that did IPOs, uh, over 10 of them actually became unicorns. So that really means the people that are bringing innovation to cybersecurity space, you got the people's and the organization's attention because you're really solving a critical enterprise and government pain point. So that really means you're set to do 30, 50 X or even bigger growth. So oh, just a, one, one little point I want to add as well. When we talk about cybersecurity and the scope of it, we're not just talking about cybersecurity companies. We're talking about every company that is now understanding the need for cybersecurity, but also understanding the critical understanding of cybersecurity, which has made its way up to boardrooms of major organizations and is continuing to become the norm. For example, in the past, it used to be when reporting to the board, um, the CISO or a different C-suite individual would be somewhat understanding around cybersecurity and be the one to give over the information. However, it's becoming more standard to have a cybersecurity expert within the boardroom of major organizations and even smaller organizations as, as time is going on to really understand the scope of it, the need for it, and what to do within these organizations to keep things safe. So Anthem, going back to, to your, your discussion around the use of distributed databases, I, you know, we understand that under the status quo um, where we uh, have cloud providers um, providing a decentralized but not distributed infrastructure, that there still is a lot of resistance to moving to distributed databases. Uh, can you explain why that is? And can you also highlight some of the limitations with uh, distributed databases in terms of, of speed and whether that is uh, a, a major concern that holds uh, the market back from moving to a fully distributed database approach? Well, to answer your latter question, I think that's a really astute question. I think that speed, uh, bandwidth time is holding back distributed solutions. And I think that ultimately as these distributed solutions, these public protocols get more and more adoption, that we're gonna have less and less of a speed or what they call latency problem. And, and ultimately, this is an important uh, place for central processing, central application, central databases is pure raw speed. Um, one of the big restric uh, restrictions, I would say, are kind of hesitations for legacy enterprise cloud central hosted providers is that they've spent so much in capital expenditures already. Um, it's a bit like uh, in poker, once you already have the pot committed to, then it's a lot cheaper just to kind of keep committing to that pot. Um, it's a bit similarly, and ultimately it's been a game of mass and a game of largesse. And ultimately that has been gotten centrally in really public protocols invented by Bitcoin. And now there's thousands of others that are vying for commercial relevancy have created mass in a distributed way that allows anyone to participate and eliminates the need for the participants to have to spend on capital expenditures. It's basically a choice uh, whether the participants of the public protocol want to invest in the hardware to, to secure the network or not, or, or just to participate and use 
the services of the software. So um, yeah, I, I think that we're just in really early days. It's 12 years old in terms of how long this type of software has been invented. And I think we're just starting to realize uh, its power. So I, I think this is a super exciting time to be alive and certainly to be an investor in the space. Um, it, one thing I see a lot is the innovation in the blockchain space, uh, specifically in three or four areas. One is uh, we went really through various generations of blockchain technology. We can call Bitcoin kind of blockchain 1.0. When Ethereum came around, blockchain 2.0, which introduced smart contracts. The new generations of blockchain 3, 4, and 5 are really changing the game by introducing more sophisticated consensus mechanisms, like, for example, proof of work, sharding techniques. And what this allows you to do is to increase the transaction rate of these distributed decentralized databases to over a million transactions per second. Because if you're using this technology to protect the smart cities of tomorrow or to protect, for example, things like DeFi contracts, which are the banks of tomorrow, the decentralized financial in institutions of tomorrow, you need to have blockchains that have this transaction processing cap capacity, not only to process the transactions, but also to protect this space and provide the necessary confidia confidentiality, integrity, and identification uh, in the process. So uh, pulling a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one, when we opened the session, we, we actually asked a bit about the cybersecurity landscape and would like to go back to that. Um, particularly, what are some of the types of players? What are the opportunities? And what kind of organizations should, uh, should, uh, should we be inclined to? Are, are, is it just the, the big names, uh, the big trusted names in cybersecurity? Or uh, is it working with specialists? Is it a combination of both? I uh, would love to hear about the competitive landscape and some of the, the key players and the differences between working with larger, uh, organ the large mega organizations in the space versus the more specialist. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in with a quick stab at uh, one thing, just to create a little bit of understanding what the past landscape was and where we are today. So in the past organizations, we could talk about not too long ago, but organizations would buy by brand. There were reputational companies out there and anyone who was in the buying power or decision makers, it was buy by brands, buy by the most known organization because you can't hold liable, be held liable if you really chose that brand that everybody goes to, even though it might not be as secure or as good as the other things out there. So you're where you are in that trusted element, even if something went wrong, but you can't hold me liable. This is what everyone's doing. So of course that has changed with time and many players have surfaced whether they're not the bigger organizations, but they're showing the different types of security and trust element that is needed right now moving forward. Um, when you talk with different service providers, you talk with different organizations, there's a lot that they say go hand in hand. So you don't have that single point of entry of effect of having problems from maybe one element when you're doing your stack of security. Um, it's important to buy by what is the best for you? What is the best for organization? What is the new standard? Why is that standard there? And what should we be doing? And actually deciding to take that approach of, I need to do what's best for my company. I need to do what the best security is. It might not be the most well-known company, but certainly has the best security. So that has become the new norm just across the board of when you're looking at the right type of security and certainly seeing decentralized networks and understanding decentralized security and how things work and this not having a single point of entry, that is talked about across, across um, the ecosystem and understanding that we really must protect around every single point within the organization. We have to implement zero trust, of course, and I'll just um, talk for a second what zero trust means um, in case some of the, the viewers might not uh, be familiar with that term. Zero trust really talks about identity and access um, for example, we could talk about how it used to be in the past. And an example I like to talk about is think of a castle. In the olden days, uh, you know, your castles, you lay over the drawbridge, somebody comes over the drawbridge into the castle, full access of the castle. So you have that one point of entry, you come inside, you can go anywhere and everywhere you want, you have full access. Zero trust means, okay, you might've gotten into the castle, but anywhere, any of the doors you wanna get into, you need to stop, identify yourself there and understand if you have access in, then you can go. If you don't have access, you're blocked. 
So zero trust, you're not trusted till you identify yourself. So of course, zero trust needs to be implemented, but what are the other layers? How do you protect across the board? So as the ecosystem and as we're moving towards, let's call it the future of work, what does the work look like? And it's not, doesn't just mean of how do we work, whether it's a hybrid, work from home, remote, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's also how are we behaving as organizations, as companies, as uh, providers, or as customers? What are we looking for? We're looking for the best type of security. We're looking for the best people. We're looking to create that proper cyber hygiene with or in the organization. And the hybrid model is where a lot of um, organizations are going to really understand that they can get the best security from both and buying from the larger brands might not always be the right way to go. So we have several questions from the audience about the impact of social media, the use of social media. We have one from uh, Subra Prakash Deb, another from Inan Masroor. They're asking how, how, with a lot of our data sitting across social media platforms, how, how do we ensure uh, data protection and how can we use social media more securely uh, to prevent personal cyber attacks? Um, and again, uh, I'll just open this one up to the panel, anyone who would like to jump in and take it. I mean, I, I would say um, it's really um, up to the social media provider, ultimately. I mean, sure, as a user, you can be careful about what you're posting and remember that all your pictures have metadata attached to them. So just be really cognizant. But I mean, at the end of the day, just like George was saying, I mean, Facebook, which is you know, arguably the largest social media company on the planet when you factor WhatsApp and you factor Instagram. And I mean, they weren't able to keep the credentials safe of people. So, uh, I mean, the reality is, is that in a world of noise, um, social media companies, search engine companies are really incentivized just to have more content out there. And uh, it's kind of unfortunate for all of us users because whether that content is malicious or not malicious or whatever various degrees of truth or not, um, it's really content is king. So there, there's a bit of a, a, a kind of a discrepancy in the incentive structure, you could say, for the user's personal data and the social media company's purpose, which is ultimately to disseminate data. So. Um, you know, there's companies like MeWe.com, for example, that we do have a partnership and a, a, a seed stake in as a company at Hera, you know, that, that are trying to, you know, be more user first and not sell advertisements. Still, any centrally housed data is prone and you have to assume has already been stolen and, 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 and resold because, you know, centralized systems are... Um, are, are able to be protected. And you can look at the Federal Reserve going down a month ago, I think is pretty clear evidence of that. Acer Computer is, you know, publicized. They have a $50 million ransom bounty on them as a computer company. You know, George mentioned the famous RSA hack that went public about a decade ago. Um, you know, Uber has been a recipient, you know, Marriott, you know, the list is a uh, very, very large companies that, that have um, Stan's corporation, of course, the famous Iranian attack. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's the world we live in. So we need to compute smarter, which is to compute in a distributed way, which fortunately Bitcoin gave us that opportunity to now do. And effectively with Hera, we've created a trust computer, basically a cloud that is comprised of 100% public protocols we can swap the layers in and out, uh, which makes it really unique from a central stack like a Linux LAM stack where you're stuck in the stack, for example. Um, and, and yeah, like Shira, um, I think what it was also articulating, organizations are really looking deeper now because they're not trusting the brands anymore um, because the brands are letting them down. And when they're looking, you know, they're basically now realizing that are getting the same centralized solutions that ultimately their own systems are prone to. It's just filtering the traffic twice effectively. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a just exponentially amounts more interest now than versus even six months ago. And uh, I think it's just a really good market indicator that people are taking cyber security seriously. And, and that means that they're being materially affected by it. 
as uh, eloquently said, Anthem, um, I just want to dive just for a moment um, to your question, what people do and how social media is viewed as and how data can be siphoned in so many different ways. Uh, just to give a global understanding around social media, people look at their social media accounts from many different perspectives. They might look at LinkedIn as their business account and act a certain way professionally on LinkedIn. They might do a little less on Twitter and Facebook. They might say, you know what, that's my personal stuff. You can't tell me what to do. But think about it from a data grab. Think about it from a fishing perspective, spear phishing, a whale phishing. How data is grabbed in order to create these ransomware attacks is literally across the system. You may have people on LinkedIn putting way too much information because they want to look good for their next job, talking about a, a project they're working on and talking about in detail who they're working for to be very impressive. But think about the bad actor on the other side grabbing information from there. Think about them going to Facebook to the public posts. There was this years ago, there was this one bank I was doing some consulting to and they literally flipped out because one of their lead uh, the lead engineers, he put on Facebook that they're dealing with this problem in security. Does anyone know how to fix something? And he gave a little too much information. So all of us today would be like, what are you doing? But his perspective is different generational. We have the, the generations today living on social media, living out there, not thinking about oversharing be a problem because everything is open. Everything is shared. There's no privacy what is the problem? And this engineer's perspective was, well, most of my friends are engineers. I was just asking for help. He didn't stop and pause and think, wait a minute, now I'm just making it world readable that this bank is using this security. We have this vulnerability. Hey, everybody come in and see what's going on. So it's also the education around people should understand what they're doing, what they're putting out there. As Anthem said, when you put something out there, it's not private. There's ways to get to it. There's metadata out there. There's extra information that people are looking to grab. You're not just sharing, you're giving over information. So when you put something out there, stop and pause and think, is this okay for everybody to know? If I say I'm getting on a plane and I'm traveling with this little window of opportunity that I'm on an airplane and somebody else is going over to another channel and seeing what my position is within that, that company and knowing I'm locked down for a little bit of time, there could be openings for different types of phishing attacks that might not uh, be able to be solved at that moment. So think about all those areas, but also think about the right security to be in place in order to curtail any of these problems should they occur. I, I think also we have to change our mentality very well about data. I did a presentation to the United Nations almost over one year ago in a group from Bahrain, and it was about the term data is the new oil. So today, when you have a financial accounting system or a manufacturing system, people protect it because they consider this to be the critical element of the organization. But the modern organization of today, the wallet is the data, meaning that the data is the most valuable asset that this organization has. So this data should be protected the same way the wallets are being protected. Because if you are a Uber, if you are a Facebook, if you are an e-commerce platform organization, if you're a DeFi protocol-based uh, institution, this data is your most important asset. Any loss of this data really means that um, you have an extremely good chance of disappearing as an organization if the attack is massive. So it's, it's an end game kind of attack for the organizations of today. So, the, the level of protection that organizations need to take must be much more seriously than it's being taken today. And George, uh, just addressing a, another question from the audience, uh, do you see any specific region? I'd like to add to that question, actually. Do you see any specific industries that are more prone to cyber attacks and that lack uh, cybersecurity infrastructure? Um, yes, uh, I mean, definitely the financial sector has always been a target of attack, so they've taken the necessary investments and measures. But definitely one area where the measures were not taken definitely as serious would have been, for example, in the healthcare industry. Uh, if we look at the healthcare industry, people took um, healthcare not in a serious way until things like, for example, HIPAA came around and GDPR came around in Europe. HIPAA stands for Health Information Protection Act which was enacted in the United States and forced organizations to take things like healthcare data as serious as financial data. And definitely GDPR, once 
one step further, it says it's not just as healthcare, it's any data that um, implies protection of the privacy of the individual, which means that ownership of the data is a key element. But one of the things that's also very important about blockchain as a technology, it allows the individuals through private keys to be the owners of their data and to enact what we sometimes refer to in our business as data portability. So if you look at this in healthcare, you hold the keys to your medical records. And when you go from one clinic to another, from one hospital to the other, you carry your data with you and you open it only for the period of time that is required for the doctors to do their job. We are running out of time, so I'm not sure how many more of the Q&A questions I will be able to get to. I actually did want to go through each of the, the speakers because, again, this is such an important topic. We have so many people who have joined that uh, clearly have interest and, and relevance in this, in this issue. For those of you whose questions weren't answered, they will be shared with the panel and uh, we'll look to, to follow up with answers on those after the session. But I'd like to I'd like each of you to maybe give two or three key takeaways that you think the audience of this session should really take out of it. Uh, what are some of the key points that you think they should uh, should be considering um, and uh, you know maybe help them turn this into actionable intelligence and how they can operate their businesses and their personal lives with better cybersecurity and, and data protection? Maybe uh, we can start with Anthem, Shira, and then George. Well, I, my favorite advice to anyone when they're protecting their uh, software keys to Bitcoin, for example, is to write everything down on paper and store it somewhere safe and don't hold all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, be very, very careful with two-form authentication on your cell phone. I mean, I've had my SIM uh, hacked uh, at least twice that I know of. Um, in the past. And so two-form authentication on text message is not secure. Um, you need to be using something like Authenticator by Google or there's many other other uh, ways to authenticate now. So, um, and, and I would just say, stay curious as always, you know, stay, stay aware, um, you know, really use very long passwords when you're securing anything, write them down, try not to reuse the same passwords because assume everything that you put in anything on the internet today, someone else has. So um, you just have to make that assumption. So um, that those are my common sense words of advice, you know, until we get to a distributed computing landscape, unfortunately, we're gonna continue to be plagued by these centralized cloud computing issues, ransomware, denial of service attacks. It just is what it is. I will echo um, Anthem's, uh, uh, what, he's, what, he, what he mentioned, also just common sense piece. One of the most important things, if not the most important things when it comes to personal cybersecurity is stop and pause. Stop and pause before you do something. Think about, is it, are you doing it the right way? Are you giving access in a different way? You wanna quickly post, you're multitasking. We're living in a world that's moving so quickly and everybody is moving in lightning speed, whether it being in your daily routine, whether it being in your work routine or a hybrid of both. We're using multiple system, multiple devices. Stop and pause, think about what you're doing. That is probably the most critical thing when it comes to human personal cyber security. Um, another piece would be with organizations. Think about all three pieces, as I mentioned, the people, the process and the technology. You can have the best people within your organization to deal with security measures, to be able, the business acumen, all those things. You have to have the best security as well. And your process, that's the glue in between, is the critical element bridging the two. How are you protecting your organization within? How are you protecting your customers from without? How are you doing all those processes and have them lined up uh, importantly? Be proactive as well as reactive. They are both as important as each other. So make sure to have those both set up as well. Uh I have basically three simple takeaways from uh, today's session. The first one is that security is much more than just a product, it's a continuous skilled process. So you need to continuously protect your environment. The second thing is that you need to refresh your technology to use modern tools to help protect your data the effective way. So 
go and get the right necessary infrastructure to protect your data in an effective way, modernize your cybersecurity. And the third element is an area I find very dear to me, which I usually call agility. Uh, you need to understand it, the importance of things like cyber drills, which is the, almost like what you do when you evacuate a building when there's a fire, which really means that you need to practice your response to a cyber attack before the attack, not during an attack. So you know what are the necessary steps that you need to do to recover from that cyber attack in the, with the least damage possible uh, to the organization or to the individual. Well, thank you so much to everyone for this uh, insightful webinar. Again, certainly hope that everyone is able to, to enjoy those, those key takeaways and implement them in their businesses and their personal lives. Uh, certainly, again, anyone who would like to engage with or connect with Harrisoft, we'd be, uh, the AIM Summit team would be delighted to connect you. Um, please join our next webinar. That's going to be a fireside chat with none other than Dr. Mark Mobius uh, and Salman Joffrey from the Dubai International Financial Center. That's going to be taking place on the 20th of April at 4 p.m. Gulf Standard Time, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. We're looking forward to hosting you all then. And until then, uh, again, thank you so much to, to our audience, to our sponsors, and to those who've uh, been able to share with us today some of the key insights and takeaways for cybersecurity protection. Thank you.